for 25 minute fizz time and let's talk protein. All right, here's a brief outline of what we're gonna cover today. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you because you're all very smart, but this is the point in the video where I convince you to make sure you watch the entire thing. Cause you may be thinking, oh, protein, I don't know. And now you see the list and you're like, oh, definitely. Cause I wanna know about something on there. All right, so let's get into it right away. Now I love this, uh, this meme, if you will, and much credit to whoever dillololol.com or whatever the hell that is. But it's really, really funny, right? Uh, so I have other videos where we're gonna talk about the post-exercise anabolic window and things like that. Um, but I do like to leave this in just to make you laugh a little bit um, because it's important that we have a conversation about protein itself. Now, I remember probably being all the way up through a doctoral student before anyone ever, well, actually no one ever really explained, but I finally figured out what people mean when they say protein because it's very confusing. And so when we in the exercise science, nutrition, strength training kind of feel, think about protein, we tend to think of, okay, I eat steak or I eat whey protein powder or eggs or whatnot, and that goes into my stomach and then I get muscles, right? And, and that's partially true. But it's really confusing when you start then getting into the molecular side, biochemistry and other stuff, because people throw this term protein, 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 and you're just, you're just so confused on what they're talking about. Well, one of the things we have to understand is protein is a bit of a ubiquitous term. Um, there are tons of different proteins in your body. Some of them are the proteins you think about when you think about your biceps, your quads, or the muscles on you. But you have to remember or realize, I guess, that even things like your red blood cells are proteins. Uh, your hair, your fingernails are proteins. I always look at this picture and I always think, I wonder how they wipe their stuff. Maybe. Maybe they watch too much of my Why You Fart video and I, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, like everything, right? And so there, there's so much more going on with protein when we talk about it. So if we get in discussions about protein deficiency, it's not just about, well, I have plenty of muscle, I'm fine. Sure, we have to realize the other functions that proteins serve in our body. And so here's just a small list. And uh, I think I pulled this honestly straight off of Wikipedia or something like that. So you, you could do more stuff. But I wanted to just highlight and put you in context of what we're talking about. And so there are really four different classical protein types. Now, I'm not talking about, okay, whey, casein, soy, things like that. Those are foods. These are, what I'm talking about here are, are molecular biology types and classifications of proteins. Number one is what we call structural. And this is exactly what we're used to talking about, actin, myosin. If you don't remember, actin is one of the things that makes up your muscle. And so protein does provide a lot of structure. And in fact, because of this, and one of the assignments that we'll do in my class, um, you'll figure this out on accident, so this is a bit of a, a hint here, if you will. But you basically can't find any living things that you would eat that don't have some protein. Even grass has protein, right? And so it's involved in everything because it's required to have structure. If you find something in biology that is alive, that has structure, it probably is made of proteins in some percentage of it, right? So it gives in shape and, and structure to the cell or even the organelle. Uh, there's proteins in the cell wall, there's protein inside of the cell, there's proteins outside of the cell, I mean, they're all over the place. You may also not have realized that all of your enzymes, those things, those catalysts that you need to, to allow chemical reactions, those are also proteins, okay? So it takes a bunch of different proteins to make those up. So in fact, if you wanna measure how many enzymes uh, are in your leg or something like that, you are actually just measuring how much of that protein is there or how active it is, depending on what you're doing. Uh, they can also be receptors, so these can be embedded in the cell walls, and, and these are then allowing communication in and out of the cell. Uh, and you can see the examples there um, for steroids and, and glutamate and things like that. And then they also have other specific functions, so you may not realize your antibodies, um, your neuropeptides, um, your nucleotides, all of these things are different proteins. And so it really is by far the most fundamental structure in all of biology. Now, some other ones that are more, uh, uh, some specific examples of some proteins that you're aware of, and then of course, the vast majority of this is gonna be sports nutrition here. Um, so we're gonna get into the stuff you really have heard of and BCAAs and all that stuff, but um, just helping again highlight the bigger picture here so you're not so confused in the terminology. So four classic examples, uh, keratin, um, I'm sure you've heard of that, but that's what makes up your hair and nails, and that's a very famous protein. Uh, hemoglobin is what carries oxygen around your blood cells. Uh, the, the version of it that's in your muscle is called myoglobin, right? So if you remember that, myo meaning muscle. So if it's in your blood, it's hemoglobin. If it's in your muscle, it's myoglobin. But those are proteins. Insulin. You've all heard of insulin, right? And when you think of insulin, you think of sugar and carbohydrate. 
but you have to realize insulin itself is a protein. Right? And then of course, pepsin. Uh, and that's the thing that aids in digestion of proteins. And so it, it's in some or very versions of it or similar, some things that are similar to it are in like digestive enzymes for proteins and things like that. So that's a global idea and concept of, in fact, there's about 100,000 different types of proteins uh, in the human body that you would be related to humans in terms of sport nutrition or physiology or health for that matter. The last little piece here, we also have to, because of that, we have to realize that there's a very strong relationship between protein and immunity. Now, I'm simply, I'm certainly not saying that if you eat more protein, your immune system gets better. We have to understand hormesis, right? We have to understand curves. If you have enough eating more, does it make it better? If you're insufficient though, if you are um, not having enough protein in your, in your diet, then having more protein will augment the immune system simply because you're, you've been cutting it short anyways. So inadequate protein can lead to poor functioning specifically of the T cells, which um, you can go back and look at that up, look up what that means, but that's a problem. And again, that's because your immune system, your antibodies, et cetera, are all made of protein. So if you have some sort of insult or attack in your body and you try to defend that off and you don't have the available amino acids to make the proteins to make the antibodies, uh, you're in trouble. Right? So again, if you're eating an, even a reasonable, even slightly low amount of protein, you're just fine. Um, you have to get probably pretty low in the protein scale for uh, immune problems to really develop. Okay, so let's get into the basics and start off at the, uh, not the smallest level, but a pretty small level. You may remember from middle or high school or something like that, that your immune, uh, that your proteins are made up of what are called amino acids. And these are the smallest functional group of a protein. So there's a whole bunch of them. I don't make my class memorize them. You can if you'd like, but I don't make them do that. If you take amino acids and put them together, somewhere between two and 50 amino acids combined together, we call that a peptide. Right? And it doesn't matter which ones they are. If you stick more of those together, we call that a polypeptide, just like we call it a polysaccharide in, in the case of carbohydrates. And these are non-branched uh, non -branched chain of peptides. If you take enough of those things to put them and put them together, one or more of those polypeptides, and now you're usually talking more than 50 amino acids, we call that a protein. That's all we're really talking about when we use that phrase, protein. Now, like I said, there are, you know, call it 20 or so amino acids, and it gets a little bit gray there depending on what's going on. Uh, and some of them are classified as what we'd say essential, and some are non-essential. Now, these first ones here that I've highlighted are the ones that are called non-essential. That doesn't mean they're not important, but you don't have to consume them in your food. Your body can make them. All right, so what that means is we have the nucleotides, we have the, the foundation that's required to say build alanine. So if you need alanine for whatever reason, you can bring in spare parts that your own body can make and put them together. These remaining nine though, you can't do that. Um, there's also like six other ones that are what we call conditionally essential, uh, but that's really not usually an issue for sport performance folks. So uh, the essential ones are this. Now, if you look throughout the research and we'll get to this a little bit later, but I really wanna make it clear in multiple parts of this video, Essential amino acid intake is what's really going to drive uh, the boat and determine things like maximum muscle growth. It's not as much, or well, it is total protein, but that's really a surrogate. The more specific thing is, are you getting enough essential amino acids? If you do, you cross the, what we'll call the threshold of growth and you'll grow plenty. If you continue to consume more, pro say total protein, but you're not getting enough essential amino acids in, even though you're getting enough protein in your diet, you're not getting the correct ones that you have to consume, and so you may be leaving a little bit of muscle growth on the table. And now while we're here, uh, I mean, I could go on and make a ton of videos about all the cool things that these different amino acids um, will do, like tryptophan, most of you are aware of. We know that that thing upregulates or um, can help you build serotonin, and that makes you sleepy and all that fun stuff. But the one that you've probably heard the most about is called leucine. That's the bottom corner, that brown-ish or something like that. The reason you've heard of leucine so much is because we realize it is a very specific target and a, a on switch, if you will, for what's called muscle protein synthesis, muscle growth. And so people got really excited about that because they realized, oh my gosh, if I then make sure that I have a bunch of leucine, I'll get the rest of it, really concentrate on that amino acid, that will help me grow muscle. I'll tell you in a second whether or not that worked. But that's the one that you will see constantly. In fact, you can buy essential amino acid supplements. 
you can also buy specifically leucine supplements, and they have a special name, which I'll tell you in a second. Okay, but while we're here, we hear these terms a lot, like high-quality protein, low-quality protein, protein, incomplete, incomplete, and all that simply means is a complete protein or a high-quality protein means it contains all of the essential amino acids. Now, different foods have the essential amino acids in different quantities, but technically, for us to call it a high quality or a complete, it has to have all of them in some reasonable amount. Now, incomplete proteins or low quality doesn't mean they're bad for you. It doesn't mean they're processed or anything like that. Uh, they just aren't going to hit the numbers for essential amino acids. Now, in some cases, you may not care about that. And most of the time in our world, those sport performance, it's a pretty big deal. And so we uh, often hear, I hear folks conflate like high quality and low quality again with like processed meat versus non-processed meat. That's not what it means, right? Now, those are maybe lower quality foods if you want to argue that, but it's not a low quality protein if it hasn't lost any of its essential amino acids, if it had them to begin with. So that's all that term means. Okay, so branch chain amino acids is next. And now what that specifically means, it's a chemistry term. And if you can look at the image uh, of the organic chemistry part in the bottom, that just means that at the end, part of it is branched. Now, functionally, why you care about that, you don't. But what you might be concerned about is the fact that the, probably the most famous branched chain amino acid happens to be leucine. So therefore, people got a hold of the idea that I talked about a minute ago, said if we give you a bunch of leucine, we just market it as BCAAs for the most part. It's mostly leucine. There's a couple of other things, but it's mostly leucine. Therefore, they should have very specific and direct activation uh, of muscle growth, and they also are low in calories, etc., etc. So it should basically be a trigger to grow. Turns out it doesn't do much, with a couple of caveats. Uh, if you're having a normal amount or a sufficient amount of total protein in your diet, adding more of this target won't really do much. Think of it as a light switch. If the light is fully on and it's not a dimmer, once it's on, it's on. And so th there's a thing in, in what we muscle physiology that we call a leucine threshold. I would strongly encourage you to read uh, a lot of the work by uh, a Canadian um, professor and scientist named Stu Phillips. He's done a ton of excellent work. He's good on social media and his stuff is out there and it's very accessible as well as another resource which I'll talk about at the end of the video where you can have some fantastic free and open access reading. But he's shown pretty clearly now that once you cross that leucine threshold, any additional leucine or BCAs really don't do anything. And the problem for the supplement companies is most people hit that leucine threshold pretty easily with food. And so they don't appear to have a real advantage. Um, some people claim, and there's some very weak evidence that you may reduce muscle soreness a little bit with it, so you may not get quite as sore, but honestly, it's not, it's not particularly impressive, that research. So it generally, it doesn't do much. Um, what you can show is if you put it in like cell culture in ridiculous amounts, it helps. If you give it to people who are going through cancer, cachexia, or muscle wasting, perhaps in space flight, or um, you know, injured and you're in bed for a month, maybe you have some, some help there. And for some of you, maybe be like, actually, that's super interesting. So great. I don't, I don't think BCAs are useless, but for sport performance, they're not super important. Uh, could you make an argument? Maybe if you're going really hypocaloric and you're trying to lose a ton of weight, could you then add the BCAs in to preserve muscle mass? Yeah, maybe there's an argument there. But again, it's really not that hard to hit that leucine threshold. So you don't really need to drop a lot of protein when you're trying to lose weight anyways. So... Uh, I, again, they don't go into my useless category, but they go into my, they're very far down my list of, of things that I'm really concerned about. Um, I basically never recommend them. If an athlete really wants them, ask them why. They don't have any harm, right? Like there's no, it's just protein. So there's no downside to them. Unless of course you're liking your BCAs because they're also coming in like a pre-workout and it's jacked full of a bunch of uh, stimulants and things like that. And then I would say, just take the stimulants if you like the stimulants. And, and we'll have to have a separate videos on the pros and cons of that. But don't confuse it because it's simply, oh, I love my BCAs. Why? Because they taste amazing. Well, that's a terrible reason to take it, right? You don't like the BCAs. You just like the, the sucralose and other like lent watermelon flavor that they're putting in their pre-workout thing. And that's a crappy reason. So the BCAs themselves just don't have a lot of important function. Okay, about 20% or so of the amino acids that you're going to be are BCAs, so they are fairly common in nature, but we're going to move past BCAs now. So remember that protein has about four calories per gram 
But a major caveat here. As you've seen in some of my other videos, if you've already seen uh, the campfire analogy I give with protein, carbohydrates, and fat, go back and watch that. But remember, protein is not really here to give us energy, although it certainly has it in it. Its primary job is structure. And so we, we can metabolize it for fuel, and there are some very specific um, exercise physiology things that we would cover in that realm. But for the most part, fat and protein, or fat and carbohydrate rather, are where we get our fuel for exercise. Protein is there for structure, to build hair, nail, hair and nails, right? to build antibodies, to build red blood cells, to build uh, tissue. right? So we don't want to go burning that just for the sake of energy. It's a really poor and inefficient system. And so also along the lines, our amino acids are actually not stored particularly well in muscle. We are excellent at storing fat. We are excellent at storing carbohydrate. Again, if you think about the function, it makes total sense. Those are our fuel sources, and we want to be able to have backup fuel. We don't use protein as a backup fuel, and so we have a very difficult time storing it. As I'll show you in a second, yes, you can convert some uh, amino acids into fat, but it's, again, it's a really bad process, and so you don't really want to do it. So you can store a little bit of amino acids in your tissue, in the muscle, uh, some very specific ones, but for the most part, you really can't. Now, I want you to think for a second, what's the functional meaning of that? In other words, given the fact that you can store carbs well, and you can store fat well, but you can't store protein well, what's that mean in terms of sports nutrition? I'm not just going to give this to you. There's two or three important things here that you can think of. Right? Well... Number one, if I can't store protein well, and I'm trying to maximize my utilization of protein for the sake of, say, muscle growth, what's that mean? Well, that probably and possibly means I need to eat protein more frequently. And this is exactly why the bodybuilders did the old six to eight meals a day, super frequent, smaller meals, even the same total amount, broken up into smaller groups, consume, 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 to make sure that there are amino acids available at all times whenever your body is there to actually, and is allowed to grow some muscle. Now, if you look at the literature, it does appear that total protein throughout the day is more important than the specific timing in most cases. And so that kind of fly back and said, all right, maybe it's not a super big deal to have them all the time, but you probably don't want to have one bolus of protein a day, or rather I'll say it this way. If you probably compared having just protein once a day or even like once every two or three days, very low protein diet, maybe like, oh, I eat meat once a week. If you're trying to gain mass, it's probably detrimental. In fact, even if you're trying to preserve your muscle mass, it, it's probably, probably detrimental. Is it a big deal if you have three meals of protein a day versus six? Probably not, as long as you're getting the same total amount of protein. So a little bit of context in that scenario. A couple of other important meanings of this. And we'll get to them in just a second. If you didn't have it figured out a couple other ones on your own, you'll have to wait. So when we do break these proteins down, you have three real end products of it, or places, things that can happen. Number one, any of these damaged proteins in your body. And so if you have damaged muscle tissue, for example, or you found in a, a, a cell floating around and you says, ah, okay, it's kind of damaged, it's not functioning, it's not communicating properly with the cell next to it, your body will break it down. And some of those amino acids are then, because remember, you build amino acids together to make a protein. So when you break a protein down, you get a bunch of amino acids. Some of those can be oxidized in the Krebs cycle, um, TCA cycle, if you're more familiar. That's the same pathway that you oxidize uh, carbohydrates and fat. So it can, it can be used there. In other words, it makes a little bit of ATP energy, but not much. You can also kind of recycle the amino acids and use those for other compounds like your neurotransmitters, hormones, albumin, things like that. Or you can go through a process called gluconeogenesis where you convert the amino acids to glucose. All right, and then that's very, very possible as well. Again, it's pretty inefficient, but a plausible and possible destination um, of the amino acids. Getting it to fat is quite a bit more difficult. All right, so I'll give you a couple of answers here. One other, I've already given you one of the meanings of, of, of this idea that protein and amino acids are a bit more transient. The other one would be, what about overeating? So if you overeat carbohydrates, they're very easy to store. 
If you overeat pro, uh, fat, very easy to store. What about protein, though? Of course, if you are in caloric excess, you're going to store and gain more weight. But you're probably least or less likely to get fat by overeating protein than you are from overeating carbs or fat. Okay, and that's a really important thing. In fact, if you look at the research, I would point, uh, point you to uh, Dr. Joey Antonio stuff. And he's shown this just over and over and over again. That even if you put people way, 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 and I mean way up on protein, they don't necessarily gain weight if you don't go up in fat and carbs. And so it is the macronutrient that I use a lot even when we're trying to go hypocaloric, you know, lower in calories than we need so we can lose weight, because you can keep it really high, people still feel full, they recover reasonably well, like damage-wise, and you can still lose weight pretty easily. So it, it's very helpful that way. And now you understand a little bit about why the mechanisms uh, are what they are. So to finish this little short version of 25 Minute Fizz up, uh, here are some recommendations in terms of how much protein to eat. Now, if you want the easy idiot version, this simply says something like one gram per pound of body weight, or a little bit less. If you weigh 150 pounds, eat 130 or so grams of protein a day. It's probably close enough. Now this chart is nice because it does separate them out by different um, categories of goals and even populations. And in fact, the one that I want to draw your attention to the most is at the very bottom there with the elderly. Uh, you can look up what's called anabolic resistance, but it's very, very, very clear at this point, as you age, you need more and more and more protein. It's really, really important that you don't lose your muscle mass and you don't assimilate and utilize the protein you eat as well as you age, when you age. So you need to make sure you just eat more total protein. And that's why those numbers are pretty high in the recommendations. Uh, now these are in grams per kilogram per day. Um, so if you get to 2.2 grams per kilogram per day, that'd be the same as one gram per pound. And so if you look at the phases, a couple of other interesting things. Endurance folks still need really high amounts of protein because you're probably breaking down a lot of tissue. Again, I mentioned the weight restriction. So if you're trying to lose weight, you don't want to just drop protein. You're going to be really hungry a lot, and um, it's just not needed to get there. If you're sedentary, you could be a little bit lower, I, I guess, if you like, but I honestly don't think anyone should be that low. There's, there's no real need. There's no advantage to being there. So there's some real problems, like I said. If you don't build up muscle, especially in midlife, when you get to 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, now really getting to older life, you're going to have problems. And so I wouldn't drop the protein too much. There's no good evidence in humans that cutting protein in the midlife range is going to have any help on your aging. In fact, what we know as of now infers the opposite. It could have detriment. So be very careful there. Uh, again, my students, I, I don't make you memorize these exact numbers. It's close enough. In fact, if you just put everyone at 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight, look, that covers just about damn near everybody. Or you're close enough to within what I call the functional range anyways, where no one, you, you know, if you're programming 185 grams of protein a day and they actually hit 183, who cares? It's close enough. If they hit 190, if they hit 180, 75, it's really close enough, right? Another important thing here to notice is, is there are no sex differences. And why I note that is, well, we do see some of those things with like carbohydrate, but not with protein. So there's no, we don't have any indication that women need more or less protein than men. Maybe a little bit, but again, if you're in this, to say, kind of call everybody 1.5, it's probably close enough for, for everyone. Right? Now, what that also then means, another way to think about it is, we typically would recommend somewhere in the neighborhood of 0 0.4 or just call it 0 0.5 grams per kilogram per serving. And so if you're wondering, well, how much do I eat per meal? If you call it a half a gram per kilogram body weight and you weigh, say, 100 kilograms, that'd be 220 pounds, that's 50 grams of protein or if you want to go with the actual thing here, that'd be 40 grams of protein. So a 220 pound guy or girl should have about 40 grams of protein per meal. And if you're bigger or smaller than that, scale it up or scale it down. If you have 40 grams per meal and you eat four meals per day, that's 160 grams for your 220 pound person. That's probably pretty close. Okay, now I, again, I, I think you should do more, but this, this 0.4 grams per kilogram per meal is what is really helpful, especially if it's high quality protein, to hit that leucine threshold. All right, if these are complete amino acids, you're gonna be, or essential amino acids within that, or complete protein source, sorry, you're gonna get enough essential amino acids to so hit the leucine threshold, 
you'll be just fine to preserve or gain the muscle that you're looking for. But again, I want to mention too, uh, there's very little harm of going even way higher than this. And so these are kind of just like a minimum amount for the most part. Now, I want to point you to um, a couple of things to read. I mentioned this earlier. I said there's some places you can go and have some free reading. The International Society of Sports Nutrition has two or three excellent position stands on protein. And this is one of them. If you're not familiar, a position stand means a whole bunch of scientists, and you can see all of them there, come together and say, as a group of scientists, what do we believe is true based on the evidence we're seeing? So it's not one person's opinion or one labs or one schools or one lineage. It's a bunch of people that, you know, ideally the most, the 20 or 30 most experienced scientists in a topic get together and, and put it out there. And this is exactly what this is. So it's all, again, it's free. It's open access. It is very easy to read, um, even with a limited scientific background. So it's not like a blog post, it's not that easy, but if you're like, well, I kind of have an undergrad, or I'm working through my undergrad, or you're, I'm a 35-year-old person here, and I just follow this stuff a lot, you should have, you're fine. You'll be just fine getting through these articles, especially they do an excellent job of saying, here are the take-home messages, here's the conclusions, the summaries, all that stuff with bullet points. So I strongly encourage you to check that stuff out. And again, it is open access and free. You do not have to have any account to get there. Okay. Now, they cover a whole bunch of things in these articles, so I'm not going to do them for you. They cover things like protein redistribution. Now, this is an important idea. So, for example, if you have a bunch of mass in your shoulders, a bunch of muscle, and you don't use your shoulders for a while, and you're trying to glow, say, grow your glutes, and you're doing a lot of glute training, and you're not eating enough protein to keep the muscle here and to grow it here, your body will redistribute it. It'll start taking it from the places you're not using it and putting it in other places. And that helps explain a lot of confusion with saying, oh, I didn't eat protein or I gained muscle in my hamstrings or my arms, even though I was only eating 50 grams of protein a day, blah, 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 whatever. Yeah, you're just probably grabbing it from other places on your body. So when we're saying these numbers, what we're not, we're not saying it's impossible to do this if you don't hit these numbers. What we're saying is these look like what are optimal as the science stands now. If the science changes later, We'll change our opinion but as we understand it now if you want to maintain the muscle you have and then put more on some specific place or overall this is what you need okay so that's a common trick we see in people who say oh no it's true all you need is 30 grams of protein a day or something like that look what i did yeah sure it, they took the protein from your hamstrings or calves or whatever else stuff you weren't using so again they cover more on this topic of protein re redistribution they cover extensively the different types of proteins the advantages how much to take all that stuff are free in those articles. So honestly, it's it's a better place than for me to just lay the numbers out here. Just go to that article. It's easy, quick to access. Same thing with considerations for vegans and vegetarians. Um, proteins discussions on that. Should you have casein for bed? Is it really that different? Is it slow release? Is it not? What's that do? Does that eating before bed make you fat? Spoiler alert, it doesn't. It actually can do the quite the opposite. It's a very good idea. And, of course, the, the ridiculous idea uh, that high-protein diets are bad for your kidneys. It's not, if you have a kidney disease, potentially a problem. But, I mean, honestly, we, we slammed the door on this question 20 years ago. I don't understand why people still bring it up. But if someone's arguing with you about it or something and you want the evidence, you want a quick one-stop shop, head to that article. Now, you'll honestly notice that I'm not even on that, so I'm not trying to, like, toot my own horn. I, I wasn't a part of that thing at all. It's just, it's just really, really excellent. I used to have a lot of lecture on all this stuff, and I just threw it all away, and I'm like, you know what? It's all right here, and, and it's so well written. Just let them do it all. Okay, so that's it. That's our very basics and foundations of, of protein. If you're new uh, to, to my page here or to the YouTube stuff here, I got other ones on fat and protein and a whole bunch of stuff, so I would encourage you to explore around. But I do have one favor to ask. I've been thinking about this. Typically, I end these videos and just kind of don't know what to do, and I say something really not funny and kind of awkward and I just drag on and I was like man I need like a catchphrase you know Mark Bell has his uh making the world a safer place to lift and strength is never weakness and weakness is never strength and he has these like wrestling WWF catchphrases so I need a catchphrase to end these videos with so if you got an idea of what I should say that'd be a real zinger and it fits my personality you gotta let me know if not in fact you know what if you don't make some good ideas and suggestions, I'm going to quit making these videos. 
That's what my daughter does when she tries to get what she wants. I don't know if this is going to work. All right. Hope you enjoy. Peace out, everyone.